It's really important to distinguish between the word as a sequence of characters as opposed to word in the sense of a pairing of form and meaning, because what the language model is seeing is only the sequence of characters. And it's a bit easier to imagine what that's like if you think about a language you don't speak. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Today, I'm talking to Emily Bender, who is a professor of linguistics at the University of Washington, who has a really wide range of interests in linguistics and NLP, from societal issues to multilingual variation to essentially philosophy of linguistics. And I'm especially excited to talk to her because she was actually my teacher for Linguistics One at Stanford University where I was an undergrad. And it was one of my favorite classes. I still remember it. I still remember a whole bunch of interesting facts that I learned. And it led to this lifelong interest in linguistics that I've really enjoyed. So could not be more excited to have a conversation with her. I thought it might make sense to start with the paper that you co-authored on the dangers of stochastic parrots, can language models be too big? Which was notable <laughs> even to me on Twitter for a lot of, um, uh, I guess, controversy at Google, which I was hoping you could maybe start by describing, but then get into the meat of what the, the paper actually says. Yeah. Um, so it's not in the IPA and hard to pronounce, but the um, title actually includes an emoji, right? The last character of the title is a parrot emoji. And <laughs> Uh, we were doing that just kind of for fun because we like the stochastic parrots metaphor. And um, there was a while before all of this happened that we thought the thing about this paper would be it was the one with an emoji in a title. Like that was little <laughs> did we know. Um, but the paper came about um, because of work that Dr. Timmy Gebru and Dr. Um, Margaret Mitchell and their team were doing at Google, really trying to connect with the engineering teams to build in good practices to make the technology work better for more people and do less harm in the world. So that was sort of the, the role that they had there. And um, they noticed, especially Dr. Gebru, that there was this big push towards bigger and bigger language models, right? If mm -hmm. the paper has this table of like, just as the, the number of parameters and the size of the training data just explodes over the past couple of years, right? Um, and so uh, Dr. Gebru actually direct message me on Twitter saying, hey, do you know of any papers that um, talk about the possible downsides to this, um, any risks, or you know, have you written anything? And I wrote back and I said, no, um, I don't know of any such papers and I haven't written one, but off the top of my head, you know, here's five or six things that we could be worried about. Um, and about a day later, I said, you know what, that feels like a paper outline. So mm -hmm. here's a paper outline, you wanna write this together? And so that was early September, and the conference we decided to target was FACT, the Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency Conference, which took place finally in March 2021. Submission deadline was October, I think, 8th of 2020. So in a month, we put together this paper, and that was possible because it actually wasn't just uh, the two of us writing it or the four named authors finally, but in fact, we had seven authors. So um, Dr. Gebru brought in uh, Dr. Mitchell and um, it's really important to me to emphasize that they have doctorates, but I also know them well enough that I'm going to start full naming them now, or first naming them, actually. So Tim Neat brought in Meg and three other members of their team, and I brought in my PhD student, um, Angelina McMillan Major. And between the seven of us, we sort of had enough different areas of expertise and literatures that we've read that we could pull together this survey paper. And so it came together, and it was it was amazing. Um and also an interesting writing experience because we never had a Zoom meeting or anything where all of us spoke together. It was all done through remote collaboration in Overleaf. So not, not a super common way for research to get done, but, but it worked in this case. So the Google authors put it through what they call pub approve over there, it got approved, we submitted it to the conference and then put it away um, because none of us had actually anticipated working on that in the month of September. So it was like extra work for everybody. So we all turned back to the other stuff we need to be doing. Um, and then uh, in late November, out of nowhere, um, from my perspective, and I should say that in telling this story, I'm not at Google, I've not been funded by Google. Um, and so I only have sort of secondhand understanding of um, what went on at Google plus what was you know, uh, out in the press eventually. But the Google co-authors were told to either retract their paper or take their names off of it. And they weren't told why, and they weren't offered a chance to sort of discuss what might need to be changed about the paper. It was just retract it or take your names off of it. Um, and so we had this strange moment of, okay, what do we do with this paper? Because it seems kind of odd to put something out with just two authors that actually represents the work of seven people, um, you know, 
what do we want to do here? And so my PhD student, Angie, and I just returned to the Google co-authors and we said, we, we will follow your lead here. What do you want to have happen? And they said, no, we want this out in the world. So you two publish it. Um, and that was the initial answer. And then Timmy sort of on reflection said, actually, this is not okay. This is not an okay way to treat a researcher um, who was hired to do this research, right? This was literally her job and the job of everyone on that team. Um, and so she pushed back and the result of all that you can go <laughs> find in all the media coverage um, is that she got fired. Um, Google claims she resigned. Um, her team says she got resignated, which is a great neologism. And that went down fast enough that she was um, able to then put her name on the paper. And meanwhile, Meg started like working on documenting what had happened to Tim Neat. And the end result of that was that she was fired a few months later, but after the, the final version of the paper was done. So that's why the fourth author is uh, Margaret Schmitchell. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. um, so that, you know, that, that's a really sad story for everybody involved. I mean, it's terrible mistreatment um, of Tim Neat and Meg and the other members of their team, those who are on our paper and those who weren't. Like it's become, a, I think, a really difficult environment to work in. It's sad for Google because they lost really wonderful expertise and a lot of goodwill in the research community. And, you know, sort of sad for, um, or it sheds a light on the sad state of affairs about the way corporate interests are influencing what's happening in research in our field right now. On the other hand, you know, my co-authors and I still maintain, we all really enjoyed the experience of working on this paper together um, and of weathering the stuff afterwards together. And um, one weird result is that this paper has gotten way more attention than it ordinarily would have. I mean, I think, it, I think it's a good paper, it's a solid paper. And boy, did we put a lot of polish on it between the submission version and the camera ready because we knew it was going to be read mm. by a lot of people. Um, when I put up the camera ready as a preprint, um, I didn't put it on archive because those tend to get cited instead of the final published versions. So I just mm. put it on my website and tweeted out a link with a bit.ly link to shorten it so that I could see how many times it was downloaded. And um, it has been downloaded through that link alone over 10,000 times. Mm. Um, and I know that, that other, you know, there's been other ways to get to it, which is way out of scale to anything that I've ever written otherwise. So that's been interesting um, as a researcher, but it's also, I think, fortunate because it has come to the attention of the public. And I think that this technology is you know, widespread, it's being used, it's being used in lots of different ways. And so it's really valuable that the public at large has a chance to understand what's going on. And so um, you know, through Google's gross misstep, I um, and my co-authors have been given the chance to um, you know, help educate the public, which is um, something that I, that I do feel fortunate about. You know, I'd, I'd love to kind of get into what the paper talks about, but do you have any sense or has Google made any comments about what their, their objection was? Because I sort of had this feeling that it must be a really incendiary paper. And then in the, you know, the prep for this interview, I actually read it and it felt like pretty un uncontroversial, I guess, is, was, was my feeling reading it. So I just wonder, I mean, maybe it's hard to know, yeah. but have they said anything about why, what they um, didn't like about it? So there was, yes. I mean, in public comments, um, there's been things like, uh, it doesn't cite relevant work that is trying to mitigate some of these issues. Um, but at no point were we ever told which work we should have been citing. And we do in fact cite some work that is trying to mitigate these issues. So I don't know quite um, what that was about, but you're absolutely right. It was not, um, you know, we figured that we'd be ruffling some feathers with this paper because we were basically saying, hey, this thing that everyone's having so much fun chasing, maybe let's go a little bit slower and think about, you know, what kinds of downsides there are and how to do this safely. You know, there's going to be people who don't want to hear that. But we honestly thought it was going to be open AI who was upset because we, you know, GPT-3 is kind of the best known example of this. And, and um, it was our running example too. So we thought we'd ruffle some feathers did not realize we were gonna be ruffling feathers inside Google. And it's basically a survey paper, right? We didn't run any experiments. We didn't do any analysis. What we did was we pulled together a bunch of different relevant perspectives on large language models and sort of brought them all together in one place. Um, so it is surprising that the paper seems to have been part of the cause of, of, of Google you know, basically blowing up this amazing asset that it had in terms of its ethical AI team. Mm, interesting. 
And I guess I guess one one reading of your paper is is hey you know we should consider you know the the downsides of large language models. I think maybe another person might read it. This might be an unfair reading, but maybe I could imagine someone having hurt feelings if they were working on large language models and they read your paper as saying it's like an unethical thing to do to build large language models. Would that be like an overstatement of your claims? I, I don't have the paper in front of me, but I yeah, I think um, maybe um, that, that could hurt feelings. I'm not sure. So I, I also do a lot of work in the space of societal impact of NLP in general. Um, and that sometimes goes under the, the title of ethics in NLP. And mm -hmm. I do see a lot of people reacting to that topic with hurt feelings. And I think it's connected with the way in which people identify with their work. And so if you say, hey, let's think about this technology we're building and how it behaves in the world and what, what we can do to make it be beneficial, um, and you use the term ethics to describe that, sometimes people want to um, read that as you're calling me unethical. And I think that that... Um, uh, that direction of the conversation is rarely actually valuable. And, you know, I do think that in general, people in this space want to be doing good things in the world. You know, certainly there are people who are working on technology with the goal of making a lot of money doing it. But I think that it's a, like, there's this caricature of, you know, the, the tycoon or whoever, who's just, you know, happy to crush all the little people to make as much money as possible. That's out there probably. But I think much more frequently, people are working within systems that give them certain commitments around maximizing value for shareholders and stuff like that, that make it harder to put on the brakes on some things that are making money right now for shareholders and take a bigger picture view. But it is much more valuable to talk about it in terms of what are those systems? What are the incentives? What can we as individuals do within those systems rather than think about people as ethical or unethical? I'm not sure that really speaks to your question, but hopefully it's somewhat helpful. No, I mean, I think you're saying that maybe your your point is a little more nuanced than than maybe someone would take away. And I can I can see, I mean, I think I I mean, I guess, you know, I run a company and I I love technology and I like I love building. I, I do recognize that, you know, lots of people get hurt. And I, I I think it's great that people are like pointing out issues and and um, you know, also kind of pumping the brakes and, and flagging the stuff. But I I just I could kind of see how someone might have might feel a little offended by it. I just, I wasn't sure if I was kind of jumping to something or like, I, like, I guess my question, well, the, the question that I, I kept thinking about with your, with the whole paper in, in general, as I was reading it is even sort of setting aside making money, right? Let's just talk about like research and just the sort of like excitement of um, mm -hmm. building, you know, models that work, which I, I just, I feel that so, so deeply, like what, you know, like GPT three yeah. for all its flaws, it's kind of amazing. Like what it, what it does. I mean, it's like, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have expected it to, to work so well. And so I guess, would, would you feel, would you argue that those kinds of directions of research should stop or what would you want an organization like open AI to, to do differently? Because I think it's a good example of a, of a place that's kind of actually really showed that bigger models do kind of, it, you know, it's not obvious that like bigger models would perform tasks better at, at many extra orders of magnitude. Like, do you, do you think, would you prefer that that research doesn't happen or happen differently somehow? So I, I think it's worth saying that OpenAI has actually put a lot of effort into thinking about what are the possible downsides and what could happen when this technology is released in the world. And, and that's... Um, important to note and I'm and I'm glad that they're doing that. I think that what what I would like to see more of is first of all that kind of work. Like what are what are the possible failure modes and how do they impact people? And then also when this is working as intended, um, you know, how can that impact people? And and OpenAI has been doing some of that and I and I think that's great and they should do more. But also there's if you can look to other fields of engineering where you know before you take something and you put it into the world in a place where people are going to rely on it, there's all kinds of testing that has to be done and sort of understanding of what are the tolerances and you know what works and what doesn't and what are the what's the range of temperatures that this thing could be applicable in and, and what are the things you have to check for and certify and things like that. And we don't have very much of that yet going on in NLP. I can speak less to other areas of AI, but I honestly I think there's there's similar issues elsewhere in AI. And so there's 
work actually that was done at Google um, by Meg Mitchell and Tim Nick and others on um, a framework called Model Cards, which was mm -hmm. sort of steps in that direction of like, if you've built a model, what does somebody who's going to use this model need to know about it? And that's the kind of thing that I would like to see more of. And that is in contrast to just rampant AI hype where people build something, it's cool, it's fun, it works well, and somehow that's not enough. And people have to say, you know, it's not enough that GPT-3 can produce coherent text. People have to say it's understanding language, which it absolutely isn't, as I'm sure we'll talk about later. Yeah, um, you have two good segues, but yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it is all connected, right? Um, yeah. So, so for some reason, the culture around AI is all about these, like, trying to reach for these big claims rather than trying to build um, really well-scoped, reliable sufficiently documented that they can be used safely and reliably systems. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's the direction that I would like to see more of um, is one thing. And then another thing, um, and we get into this in the paper, is that if the main pathway to success these days is just bigger and bigger and bigger, then you cut out lots of languages, communities, even within the languages that generally are well supported, because they just can't amass that much data. And you also cut out smaller research groups, smaller companies, that are not sitting on the kind of collections of data that you know Google is or Facebook is or Amazon is. Microsoft also does a bunch of big data work. They don't seem to have amassed data quite the same way as the other big ones. And that is unfortunate because it, I think, stifles creativity to a certain extent. If, if the, the whole community is rushing towards this one goal that only some can really effectively do, then mm -hmm. we lose out on the other things that people might be trying instead. And I guess maybe a less obvious concern that you you talk about in the paper is is talking about how the models can encode bias in ways that are hard to to notice. And mm -hmm. I, I was wondering if you could, like like I guess when you talk about the harms that might happen from natural language models, do you do you do you have examples of things that like are actually happening now, or is this more of like a future looking thing of like we're worried about as as NLP becomes more pervasive? like worrying yeah. about future harms. Yeah, no. So, I mean, absolutely happening now um, and therefore easy to predict that it will keep happening in the future if we don't change. Um, and here, um, the work of Safia Noble with her book, Algorithms of Oppression is a really important you know, documentation of this. So she looked into what are the ways in which identities, which properly belong to the groups of people who have those identities are represented and reflected back to people in search. And in particular, she, you know, her running example is the phrase black girls. Um, and also black women. And uh, you know these things have changed over time and she's very careful to document when she's talking about particular examples, what the date was. But early on, um, as she started this project, the phrase black girls as a um, search keyword basically turned up pornography. And that you might say is, well, that's just in the data. Well, what data, right? Where did that data come from? And uh, if you, get into the you know the heart of her book it's basically around that that's in the data because of the way in which the economy of the internet allows people to purchase and make money off of identity terms and you know once these things were flagged the google sort of like piecemeal making changes so you don't get pornography as the results for the search term black girls anymore but it's also possible to sort of poke at things and tell that it that it's it's very much sort of individual after the fact changes, as opposed to anyone going through and systematically thinking about how to redesign the way that search engines and the sort of advertising driven um, ranking of search latches on to these incentives and then amplifies them. So one, one ongoing discussion um, in the AI community, you see it pop up on Twitter with great regularity is, is the problem that the data is biased only or do the models also contribute? And the answer is absolutely models also contribute. And then there's this other layer to it of, well, that's just what's in the data. So you know, one of the um, other really embarrassing examples for Google was uh, there's a point at which um, Google image search turned up pictures of gorillas when you were searching for black people. And I forget exactly the, the particular configuration of that, but embarrassing and awful and racist. And one reaction at the time was, well, that's just in the underlying data. And so, you know, not our fault. We're just showing what, what the world is saying, except that it's not true. 
right? Because the the way the algorithms that do the you know ranking of search results and also um, the bidding for the AdWords is that is emphasizing particular incentives. Um, so there is a certain thing in the underlying data. There's also the question of how did you collect that data? Where did it come from? What does it actually represent? It is not the world as it is. It is some particular collection of data. And then what is the optimization metric? What are all these modeling decisions that you've made? And how does that interact with the various biases in the data? And you know, what's the incentive structure? So Sophia Noble's work is a great point to look. Uh, Latanya Sweeney documented, um, this is a 2013 paper, how uh, if you put in at that point an African-American sounding name, one of the ads that would pop up suggested that that person had a criminal history. And if you put in a white sounding name, you tend to get just say more information about so-and-so. And that does real harm in the world. And it wasn't a, you know, 100%, but it's significantly different between the two groups of names. It does mm-hmm. real harm in the world because if you imagine someone is applying for a job or you know just making friends and someone does a Google search on them and here comes alongside this message suggesting they might be a criminal, mm-hmm. right? that does harm. And then if I can give one more example. Um, Please, yeah, these are great. Yeah, yeah. Um, Elia Robin Spear did a really interesting worked example around sentiment analysis and word embeddings, All right? Mm-hmm. So sentiment analysis is the task of taking some natural language text, um, and in her example, it's English, and uh, using it to calculate or predict the sentiment. Is this a, is this a text expressing positive feeling towards something, negative feeling towards something, or not expressing feelings. And the particular data set she was working with, I think, was Yelp restaurant reviews. So there, it's take the text, predict the stars. Yeah, I've I've Uh, used that data set. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, And then as an external component, she's using word embeddings, which are representations of words into a vector space based on what other words they co-occur with. Um, So some of the training data is in domain, the the Yelp reviews, but then there's this component that's trained on general web garbage. Mm -hmm. And uh, what she found using these sort of generic word embeddings was that the system systematically unpredicted the star ratings for Mexican restaurants. Hmm. All right. And so she digs into it and looks into it and looks into why. And it turns out that because that general web garbage included the discourse about immigration into the US um, from and through Mexico, which has lots of really um, negative toxic opinions of Mexican people, Mm -hmm. the word embeddings picked up the word Mexican as akin to other negative sentiment words. And so if in your review of the restaurant, you called it a Mexican restaurant, according to the system, you have said something negative about it. So you can't possibly be giving it a five-star review. Well, that's a really interesting example. And I guess I was, my next question is going to be, how do models play into this? I guess that's a good example of how not just the underlying data can, can have bias, but the model can literally have its own mm-hmm. bias. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is the word embeddings picked up on co-occurrences between the word Mexican and lots of other things that also co-occurred with negative sentiment. And then that was used as a component in this other model. So yeah, there wasn't in the underlying Yelp reviews, you know, any particular reason that the Mexican restaurants were rated lower, right? Right. Um, I, I don't know for sure if that if they were rated like on average exactly the same, or but it doesn't matter because the error was the system under predicting for any given restaurant. You know, on average, it was it was missing in the low direction. So yeah, so that's that's um, a kind of bias that was picked up from an external data set, right? And you know we tend in NLP to use word embeddings as really handy, detailed representations of of word in quotes meaning, right? So right. word similarity, including semantic similarity. And um, if we don't pay attention to where you know what meaning was picked up, what co-occurrence was picked up, then we can end up with stuff we really don't want in our systems. And I guess what what would you recommend doing about that? Because they are they are really useful word embeddings. So so and and I'm sure I'm sure in this case it seems pretty simple of like you're actually like it's hurting your performance, right? So there's not even like a model performance trade off here. So what could you what could you possibly do? Um, so there is a lot of work on so-called debiasing of word embeddings, um, and if you if you look at Spears' work, she continues on to to do some of that. Um, and I think that part of it is work with more curated data sets. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the discourse around immigration from and through Mexico 
even if you stick with only things like, you know, reputable news sources, you're still going to find that garbage, right? So that's, you know, that alone is not going to solve it, but it can be better, right? This is, it's not possible to come up with a fully, you know, bias free data set nor fully bias free word embeddings, but you can do better. Um, so, so one step is to sort of say, okay, how much better can we do with curated data? What about debiasing techniques for the biases that we're aware of? Part of the problem with the debiasing techniques is that you have to know what you're looking for. And then on top of that, to think through, you know, failure modes. So in a particular use case, when you're building some technology, who are the stakeholders? Who's going to be impacted by it? If someone's restaurant rating is underpredicted for some reason, what does that mean in an actual use context? And what should we be testing for, right? To, to see if we have sufficiently debiased for our use case for the stakeholders who are most likely to experience adverse impacts. I guess um, it does seem like it would be incredibly, I mean, it seems like it would actually be impossible to, to find a sort of unbiased data set of human. Right. In doesn't, language. doesn't exist. <laughs> um, and I guess these are good segues into other papers that, that I want to talk about. So, so maybe we should just, in the interest of time, we should move on to the, the, the second paper that we want to talk about just to make sure we, we get to it, which is around, let me see if I can summarize this. So this is, this is basically sort of saying that language modeling only on kind of what, what you call form, which I think is just sort of like the words kind of coming through the sort of, this is kind of the GPT-3 types of models that just sort of like look at these strings of words, can't have understanding, like true understanding. And, and I thought, I just thought one thing that was interesting is that you said you wrote the paper to sort of like end some kind of debate on Twitter that I was definitely not aware of. Um, and I actually, I think I'm kind of coming into something with maybe more context than I, than I knew. So maybe you can sort of summarize what the different possible positions are here and what, what you yeah. wanted to put to rest. So I kept finding myself getting into arguments on Twitter with people who were claiming that language models were understanding things. And, and I was like, no, they're not. They can't possibly be. And it's important to pin down what we mean by language models, right? So a language model is something like GPT-3 or BERT or otherwise, where its training data is a whole bunch of text and the training task is predicting words in the text. So sometimes it's done sequentially, sometimes it's done with a, a masked language model objective where certain words are dropped out and the, the training objective is, okay, well, put those words back in and then, you know, do your model updating to you know, gradient descent, et cetera, right? And for me as a linguist, I look at that and go, okay, useful technology, interesting, incredibly helpful in things like speech recognition and machine translation, where an important subtask is, okay, what's a likely string, mm -hmm. right? So in a, in a speech recognition setup, the acoustic model says, okay, here's a range of, of text strings that sound might have corresponded to. And then the language model comes in and says, okay, yeah, but it's important to wreck a nice beach is a ridiculous thing to say. And it's important to recognize speech is a reasonable thing to say. So we're going to rank that one higher. Right? So that's, right, right. That, that's the kind of form-based task that they're um, initially meant for and good at. And then what's happened with the neural language modeling revolution in the past few years is that when you extract the word embeddings from the language model, you have really finely uh, fitted <laughs> representation of word distribution which is very useful. And some of them can even do um, where you get the, the word embeddings are contextual, right? So the, the information about the word and what it's likely to co-occur with isn't about that word across all the text, but about that word in its current context. So super useful, but not the same thing as understanding language. And I kept getting into arguments with people who were not linguists who wanted to say, yeah, it is. Um, so Alexander Kohler and I wrote this paper to just sort of say, okay, look, here's the argument, why not? With the hopes that that would put an end to it, and it didn't. Like people still want to come argue with me about this. But the the thing that is really hard to see, and like sort of the value of linguistics in this place, is that when we use language, we use it. And I'm sorry, I'm going to pull out a philosopher on you here, but Heidegger has this notion of thrownness. So you're in a state of thrownness when you are not aware of the tool you are using. And if you think about, you know, typing on a keyboard um, when it's going well, the keyboard disappears, right? And then you have a key that sticks and then all of a sudden the keyboard is very, you know, there for you again. Well, language is the same way. When we are speaking a language that we are fluent in, it is not very visible to us until something makes us focus on it. And of course, linguistics is all about focusing on the language. So linguists are used to doing that. So when we talk about giving words to a language model, 
it's really important to distinguish between the word as a sequence of characters as opposed to word in the sense of a pairing of form and meaning, because what the language model is seeing is only the sequence of characters. And it's a bit easier to imagine what that's like if you think about a language you don't speak. So what's a language you don't speak? Mandarin. Mandarin. Okay. You don't speak Mandarin. I assume you also therefore don't read Mandarin. Right? Definitely don't. Well, okay. Yeah. You maybe recognize a couple of the characters. I mean, it's a, I read Japanese, so there's some overlap. All right. but definitely let's, let's go a little bit further away. Do, do you read Cherokee? No, definitely not. Okay. So Cherokee's got this uh, wonderful syllabary. So writing system where the characters represent syllables. If someone showed you a whole bunch of Cherokee text, that experience of looking at it would be a better model for what the computer is doing than uh, you looking at English text because you can't help but get the meaning part when you're looking at it because English mm. is a language you speak and read. And Mandarin is kind of in between there because you would pick up a few of the Hunza that you recognize from Japanese kanji and that can right, be quite right. the same. Um, and I guess, um, well, I don't know. I don't want to argue with you, but I do want to sort of like, I guess, advocate for i don't know i mean i i'm so i'm i'm not like deeply like i haven't thought deeply about this this topic but what i what i guess what i have seen in my life is these language models kind of like working better and better than i i could have imagined from the the strategy that they um employ and sort of seeming like they're getting more and more subtle detail and of course you know when i was a kid i learned about the the turing test which seems like a pretty good test of understanding on its face, right? Which is, you know, if, if sort of, I think the test is like, if you have a conversation with, with something and, and it, it, you can't tell if it's a, um, like a automated system or a um, human, then we can say that, it, that it has intelligence if it can sort of, and it sort of seems to me like these language models are on the verge of passing the, the Turing test. Mm -hmm. So like, I guess, what would it take for you to feel like some automated technique actually has understanding of, of, of the, what it's consuming. Yeah. So I think the, the first thing I want to say about the Turing test is the reason it doesn't work. And, and I hate to disagree with a giant like Turing because, you know, Turing's work was really important in foundation. But it was a hundred years but, ago. It's possible that, you know, to uh, miss something. <laughs> 70, I don't think it's 70, fair, years. fair. Yeah. All right. 80, <laughs> 70. Okay. 70. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, um, as it turns out, people are too willing to make sense of language and too willing to um, sort of build the context behind something that would make something make sense. And so we are not well positioned to actually be the testers in a Turing test. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's, that's why that doesn't work. And so the language models, because they can come up with coherent seeming text, right? These are, these are probable sequences given a little bit of sort of noise and where you start, well, what would likely come next based on all that training data, then it sort of comes out as something that we can make sense of. And then we are um, sort of easily fooled into thinking that it, it actually meant to communicate that. So you're asking the question of what would show that a machine has understanding? And I think part of it is, well, let's, let's talk about actually interfacing with the world in some way. And we certainly do have cases where machines in you know, restricted domains for restricted ranges of things that they can do, do understand, right? So when you ask your local corporate spy bot to do something for you and it does the thing, it has understood, right? You know, wait, 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 can... sorry, what's a local corporate spy bot? What... Um, sorry, oh, we can so... make it a little more concrete. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm making a snarky remark about the, um, the privacy implications of things like Siri and Alexa and Google. Oh, and, oh I see. I see. And, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> uh, Samsung Bixby's in the same space. Microsoft had Cortana, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, but, you know, when, when you ask those things to set a timer or turn on the lights or dial a phone number or whatever, and mm -hmm. it works, then yes, to a certain extent, it has understood. And it has understood because its training setup was looking at not just language, but something external to language that needed to map to that. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's a kind of understanding. And the question is how do you, so for somebody who was interested in doing that across some um, more general range of things, right? The question is how do you set up tasks that require some kind of action in the world so that it can't be done just by bulldozing it with a language model saying, well, this is a likely thing to come next, right? Mm. 
And I guess, so, so you got to describe your octopus thought experiment because that's yeah. very evocative. <laughs> <laughs> and I have some questions. <laughs> okay, so um, the octopus thought experiment is about not just being able to understand, but learning to understand. And that's the difference between it and both the Turing test and um, Searle's thought experiment, where both of those basically say, imagine someone has set up the whole system, right? Then we could test it for intelligence, or we can, as from a philosophical point of view, saying it's still not understanding. So those just sort of, the system exists and we are thinking about it or testing it. And the octopus is this thing of saying, okay, if we had something that we assume, we posit that it is hyper-intelligent. Um, and that's part of why we picked the octopus. In fact, it was initially a dolphin, but we decided that octopuses are inherently more entertaining. And also um, it was better because a, a dolphin's environment is a bit closer to a human's environment. Mm. Right? So we wanted the octopus to be something that is posited to be super intelligent. And they are, I think, understood to be intelligent creatures that we said like as smart as it needs to be, like that's not the issue. So we are assuming intelligence, but then we are only giving it access to the form of language. So in our scenario, you have these two English speaking humans who end up stranded on two nearby islands. They're otherwise uninhabited, but they've had previous inhabitants who set up a telegraph, undersea telegraph cable. So these two humans um, can communicate with each other. We left it off stage how they discovered the telegraph or that the other one's on the other island or whatever. Just that assumement exists. It's a thought experiment. You can do things like that. You know, assume a spherical cow, um, except we don't need spherical cows. Brother. So telegraph cable um, and the humans are named A and B, and they're basically using English as encoded in Morse code to talk to each other. And this hyper-intelligent deep sea octopus that we called O comes along and taps into that cable. Um, so the octopus can feel the pulses going through for Morse code. And the question is, what could the octopus actually potentially learn here? And because this is a hyper-intelligent octopus, it's got you know as much time as it wants, it's got as much memory as it wants. It is able to very closely model the patterns of you know what's likely to come next. Um, so in our story, the octopus decides for some reason that it's lonely and it's going to cut the cable and pretend to be B while talking to A. And on reflection, it's like poor B just cut off from the world, right? So maybe the octopus is also talking to B, pretending to be A, but we don't talk about that part. And so the question is, under what circumstances? could the octopus continue to fool A that it's actually B? Um, and we say this is in a sense, a weak version of the Turing test because the way the Turing test was set up, A is giving the task of deciding, am I talking to a human or not? And mm -hmm. here there's subterfuge, right? The octopus is, it, it's mere existence is unknown to A, um, right? So you know, if there's just sort of like chit chat pleasantries, those things, you can just kind of follow a pattern and it's it's, relatively inconsequential as long as what's coming out is internally coherent. And even if it's a little bit incoherent, well, maybe B is just being silly, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. matter so much. So we thought, okay, well, O could get away with that. But once you get more towards things where A actually really cares about communicating ideas to B and getting ideas back from B, it's going to get harder and harder for the octopus to maintain this semblance of, of good communication. So we go through this example where A builds a coconut catapult and the octopus is able to send back sort of like very cool invention, great job or something, even though A was asking for like, well, what happened when you built it? And, but you know, the, the octopus has no experience of things like coconuts or rope or stuff like that. So it, it can't reason about those things in the world or even know that A is actually talking about them. All it can do is come back with, well, what's a likely form of a response in this context? And to the extent that uh, O gets away with that, it's because A is willing to make sense of those utterances. Mm. O has no, no meaning in this scenario. And then finally, we have a bear show up and um, you know, start attacking A. And, and A says to O, or to B actually, help, I'm being attacked <laughs> by a bear. All I have are these two sticks, what should I do? And you know, at that point, O is utterly useless. And so we say, this is the point at which O would definitely fail the Turing test if A survived being eaten by the bear. <laughs> Um, but then we tried with GPT-2, like, what would it say? And uh -huh. it, the answers were hilarious. Like, the words are in the right topic area enough that it comes back with something funny. And I encourage people to go look at the appendix to our paper where we put these. But it's never going to be helpful. And it's it's not actually expressing communicative intent. Well, I have to say, like, walking into that paper without knowing the context, I, I, I really enjoyed it. And I, I, think I, I, I think for me, I especially enjoyed it because the sort of concreteness 
of the the thought experiment that was was like evocative but also you know kind of makes you like think like huh like 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 what, like what do I think about that and I guess what I what I kept thinking was like you know for me I feel like I've learned about a lot of things that I haven't like experienced despite I mean I was especially thinking about this kind of like learning math where there's kind of all these abstract topics and I feel like in a way I feel like I learned about math in some sense through form almost or I'm sort of just it's all in my head right I'm kind of like learning mm. things and like visualizing them and I, I kind of wondered like uh it, it seems possible to like learn to reason about things that you haven't seen or experienced just from like a, a stream of of words right or I, I even remember actually grading a, a blind student's papers that it was actually it was it was really interesting like you know how they they walk through stuff in a, in a math class and it seemed like they were visualizing things, even though, you know, they mm -hmm. never, you know, they, they were blind from, from birth. So I don't, I'm just wondering, like, um, it, I guess I'm not like totally convinced that the octopus couldn't somehow figure out what a catapult does if they kind of listen to all language. So if the octopus had actually had a chance to learn English, then yes. Right. But it didn't because it, it never got that initial grounding. And we absolutely learn things through language that are outside of what we've directly experienced. Um, you know, conversely, if you as a sighted person wanted to understand what it was like um, to live as a blind person, you could listen to or read what a blind person has to say about that and, and learn about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely something that we can do, but we can do it because we have acquired, lingu acquired linguistic systems, right? So we when we use language to communicate, we absolutely tell each other ideas and things that are outside of even our own experiences. Right? We invent things and then transmit that to other people. But we do that based on this shared system that tells us, okay, here's the range of possible forms. These are the well-formed words and sentences. These are the sounds that we use in this language. These are the way the words are built up, the sentences are built up. And these are the standing meanings that they map to. And then we use those standing meanings to make guesses about communicative intent. And the problem for the octopus isn't that it's not smart. We said it's you know hyper intelligent. Mm -hmm. It isn't that it couldn't, if it knew the language, understand those things. It's that its exposure to the language is not set up so that it can actually learn it as a linguistic system. All it can learn is distributional patterns. I guess what prevents the octopus from learning the language over time, like a like a human probably would. Okay, so. It's, it doesn't get to do, and, and in the paper, we go into human language acquisition. Um, for first language acquisition, it's all about joint attention, right? So when babies learn language, it starts from social connections to their caregivers and understanding that the caregivers are communicating something to them and then mapping the words onto those communicative intents. And the child language literature talks about the importance of joint attention, that kids learn words when their caregivers follow into their attention and attend to the same things and then provide those words. Mm -hmm. And so that, that experience, that mapping, the octopus doesn't get that. It's just getting the words going by. Yeah. So do you, do you think there's some algorithm possibly that could exist that could take a stream of words and un understand them in, in that sense? So Natural language understanding is a tremendously difficult problem because it relies not just on the linguistic system, but also on world knowledge and common sense reasoning and all those kind of things. So you could certainly is way like more certain than I actually am. But um, there's a big difference between saying, I'm going to build an algorithm that has understanding of linguistic structure, has understanding of linguistic meaning, has understanding of how those meanings map to a model of the world, and then use that to understand, versus I'm going to build a system that only gets linguistic form and assume that it will get to understanding in some way. So yes, you could, you could go much, much further with algorithms that have more in their input, in their training input, than just form. So that's going to be things like visual grounding. It's going to be things like the ability to possibly query people for answers. Um, it might be knowledge bases. It might be other sensors in some sort of embodied setup. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying that natural language understanding is impossible and not something to work on. I'm saying that language modeling is not natural language understanding. But just so I'm clear, so just consuming language without kind of all this extra stuff, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're arguing that no, no algorithm could from just that really understand language. Right. And by language, I mean form, right? So imagine that you are dropped into the Thai equivalent of the Library of Congress and you have mm -hmm. around you any book you could possibly want in Thai, but only in Thai. For some reason, this library doesn't have 
Thai Chinese, Thai French, Thai English dictionaries. It's just Thai, right? Right. Could you learn Thai? I think so. I mean, I guess what's oh. hard is that I have a language already, mm -hmm. but I, I feel like I... So what would you do? Was... What would be your first step to learning Thai if you have just oodles and oodles of Thai books and that's it around you? What would I start to do? I mean, I would... I'm not sure. Do you think I couldn't learn Thai? So I'm, I'm curious about what, what you, so you as a person, could you learn Thai? Sure. You could go take a Thai language class. No, and, no. I mean, from in this, in this situation, yeah. just sort of dropped in yeah. with a, I mean, people do like learn, like, how do people learn like hieroglyphics or something where, where there's no one around that, that still knows it. Do they need to find like a Rosetta stone or can they? So the Rosetta stone is what unlocked the hieroglyphics. If you don't have something like that, then what you have to do is resort to hypotheses about distributions and say, you know, what do we know about the world in which these texts were written? What do we know about how languages work? And can we say, okay, well, you know, given frequency analyses and the length of the words, this seems like a language that's got, you know, separate function words instead of lots of morphology. So that thing might be an article, that thing might be a copula verb, and you could, you could do some analysis like that. That's not what language models are doing, right? And then to get from those sort of structural things into something about meaning, you have to make guesses about what's being described. You have to basically bring in some world knowledge and say, how well does this fit? Mm -hmm. um, so I, when I asked you that question about what would you do, I was thinking, well, you know, possible answers are, I would go find an illustrated encyclopedia that has pictures in it, mm. right? But, but there's some visual grounding. Or I would go find a book from whose cover I could tell it was actually the Thai translation of you know, curious George. Mm. And then, Man, these are great suggestions. <laughs> yeah. but, but all of that is bringing right, in right. sort of external no, things. And, yeah. and then once you have a foothold, mm. you can build on it. Right. Mm. And, you know, that's an interesting way to go. But if you just have form, it's not going to give you that information. Well, interesting. Thank you. This is, a, this is really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess my last question on this topic is, do you sort of predict that these language models will run into like problems that will really experience and then we'll have to like kind of change the approach or, or do you think that as as like our bar for applications of natural language goes up they'll just sort of adapt and sort of find ways to incorporate external information kind of like finding the curious george translation yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so i think that language models are going to remain useful I and mean, language models have been an important component of language technology since Shannon's work in the 1950s. Like this is, this is longstanding, but I think that we are likely, it's so hard to predict the future, but the, you know, my guess is that, uh, or maybe what I would like to see is that we get to more stringent sense of, of what works and what's sort of an appropriate uh, range of failure modes and what kind of fail safes we need and people are going to find that putting language models at the center of something where your application really requires you to have a commitment to accountability for the words that are uttered is going to be a very fragile way to go. And so this, I, my guess is that when we get to that point, we're going to decenter the language models and have them be something that is you know, selecting among possible outputs again or providing these word embeddings, but they are not a step towards general purpose language understanding the way they're hyped to be. Is that sort of one, one set of problems, right? If you, if you have to have accountability for the words that are uttered, you do not want a stochastic parrot. Right? <laughs> you want something that will speak for you in a reliable way, not just make up what sounds good. Um, and then the other thing is, if we take seriously these issues around bias and encoding and amplifying bias and training data, I think we're going to find that we want to work with algorithms that can make more of smaller data sets so that we can be better about curating and documenting and updating those data sets so that they stay current with what's going on rather than this path right now that relies on very large language models. So mm -hmm. those are my guesses. There's also the environmental angle. You know, well, actually the energy uses angle is both environmental, but also about technology to a certain extent. So I think there are more and more people and you know, there's Schwartz et al, Struble et al, Henderson et al, a bunch of work now sort of saying, hey, let's make sure we're also measuring the environmental impact as we do things or the, you know, the carbon footprint so that we can direct effort to doing things in a more and more efficient way. Um, so there's that angle, but there's also many situations where you don't have the whole cloud available, right? If you want to do computing on a mobile mm -hmm. device, you're not gonna be able to have an absolutely enormous language model in there. And so there's, there's pressure to find leaner 
uh, solutions. And I think that that's a win-win, a, a you know, sort of environmentally and then in terms of more flexibility of the technology. Totally, totally. And it's a good segue because you, you pointed out a bunch of the stuff in your paper about benchmarks, which I, I'd love to mm. talk about a little bit. And may, maybe you could kind of summarize, I guess maybe start like what are benchmarks, probably most people know, but then kind of what are the, the, the possible pitfalls with them? Yeah. So I should say this is, this is a paper called uh, AI and the Everything in the Whole Wide World Benchmark that we presented at a workshop called Machine Learning Retrospectives at NeurIPS last year. Um, and it's joint work with Deb Raji and Alex Hanna and Emily Denton um, and Amanda Limpolata. And another collaboration where, um, in this case, we actually do have meetings where we talk to each other, but of those people, the only one I've met in person so far is um, Amanda Lynn, who's a PhD student in my department. So, you know, pandemic life, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we got together because we were talking about the ways in which benchmarks are being sort of misused in the AI hype machine and in AI research that is sort of striving for generality and overclaiming what the benchmark shows. So a, a benchmark is basically a standardized data set, typically with some gold standard labels, although you, know, you could also have benchmarks for things where the, the labels are inherent, like language modeling, right? The, what, what word actually came next is the gold standard label. And uh, the idea is that you might have a standardized set of training data or possibly not, and then you've got the standardized test data and people can test different systems against this. And so you have this chance of saying, you know, which, which system is more effective in this training regime or you know, given this training data against that test data. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's a benchmark. And let's say there's, you, you asked me before if I could summarize the problems with benchmarks and it's not so much benchmarks that have a problem, but the way that they're used. And I think we're, we are, this is an example of the map is not the territory. So people will tend to say, you know, here's this benchmark about computer vision. So ImageNet is that, right? Or here's a benchmark about natural language understanding of English, um, and that's glue and super glue. And people will say, um, I mean, I've actually seen this in like a, a PR thing that came out of Microsoft saying that, that computers understand English better than people now, right? Because um, this one setup scored higher than some humans on the glue benchmark. And that's, that's just a, a wild overclaim. And it's a misuse of what the benchmark is for. Um, so what's the problem with the overclaims? Well, it kind of messes up the science, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're not doing science if we're not actually matching our conclusions to what, our experiments. And we you know, live in a world of AI hype, which means that you know, people are more likely to buy into and set up solutions that don't function as advertised because they, they you know, live in a world where people are being told that, that Microsoft has built a system that understands English better than humans do. So, you know, of course you could also build an AI system that, you know, does whatever other implausible thing, like, you know, guesses someone's political affiliation by the way they smile or something, which makes no sense. But, you know, we, we live in a world where there's all these claims, overclaims about AI, and that makes these other ones also sound more plausible than they should. So those are the, those are the problems that I see, but they are, you know, benchmarking is important. There was, uh, so in the history of computational linguistics, there was a while where when you wrote a paper for the ACL, the Association for Computational Linguistics, you would say, um, here's my system, here's how I built it, here's some sample inputs and outputs, done, right? And then um, the statistical machine learning sort of wave came through and brought with it the methodology of shared task evaluation challenges, which is sort of a, a historical version of benchmarking where um, NIST and other organizations would say, okay, we want to work on speech recognition and we want to actually get a sense of how these different systems compare to each other. So we're gonna run a shared task evaluation challenge where everyone gets the same training data and um, we're gonna have some held out test data that no one gets to see. And at a certain point, all the competitors submit their systems and we see what happened. And that's an improvement in the science compared to what was going on before, but that is not the whole story, right? If you want to understand how well a system is working, if you want to understand how to build the next system, you can't just test it on some standard thing. You also have to look at, well, um, what kinds of errors does it make? And, mm -hmm. you know, how do the different systems compare, not just in their overall number, but in their failure modes and, you know, which, which inputs work for them and which ones don't and on and on like that, um, as opposed to, okay, I got the highest score. I'm done. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Well, well said, I, I guess I don't have, 
I don't know if I said out there. That's a, it's a, and, and, and I guess, can you say a little more about like, I, I feel like you're, this is a, a great paper and that you make these really concrete, sensible um, recommendations. And so you, you sort of suggest a few alternatives to benchmarks. Could you maybe run through yeah. those for anyone <laughs> listening? To yeah, this? absolutely. So it's, um, it's, it's more compliments than alternatives to benchmarks, right? So mm-hmm. in addition to benchmarks, which can be used sort of as a, as a sanity check, right? Okay, did my system actually do better than a super naive baseline? Um, or um, I want to compare some systems head to head. Let's use this benchmark. You might also use test suites, which are put together to sort of map out particular kinds of cases that you want to handle well, as opposed to just grabbing what, whatever happened to occur in your training or in your, in your um, sample test data. You might do auditing, which is very much akin to test suites and sort of saying, so this is um, like Joy Bulamwini and Tim McGebru and Deb Raji's work on auditing face recognition data sets where they sort of systematically created the set looking at two genders and a range of skin colors and sort of saying, okay, is its accuracy actually even across this set of people or no? And they found out no, right? So that's the, yeah, right? And how is that different than a benchmark? That, that kind of sounds like a benchmark, doesn't it? So it's not the way benchmarks are typically created, right? You, you, could, you could imagine someone creating a benchmark that is sort of systematically mapping out a space, but that's not the practice. The practice is we are going to go grab some data from somewhere and then hold out 10% of it to be the, the test. Um, and the other 90% is training or 80% training, 10% dev, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the way benchmarks are typically put together is let's just grab a sample of data and see how well this thing works mm-hmm. as opposed to let's create a testing regime through test suites or through this auditing process that can allow us to sort of find the contours of its failure mode. So not how well does it work on average, but okay, but how well does it work for this case and that case and that case? There's also uh, adversarial testing, which is the a few different things fall under adversarial testing. So sometimes people will create test sets by going and collecting all the examples that previous systems did poorly on to make a particularly hard test set, which is interesting in the sense that it can filter out the sort of freebies that are too easy, but also doesn't necessarily guide anything towards better performance for a particular use case, because Mm -hmm. it's just sort of like, well, we're, we're selecting for what was hard for the previous model, not what's particularly important to get right or what's uh, particularly likely to be frequent in our use case and so on. So, so that's one kind of adversarial testing. And then another one is what we did in the build it, break it shared task. So this was Alison Edinger and Suda Rao and Hal Dome and, and I in 2017 put together a shared task where we had system builders and then um, breaker teams. And the breaker team's goal was to find minimal pairs. So two examples that were minimally different to each other but would um, work for which the systems would work for one, but not the other. Mm. And that would be a way of sort of mapping out the, the, what causes system failure. Mm. Um, so you can look at that. You can look at um, error analysis. So you know, take the test set from the benchmark or the dev set from the benchmark and then go in and look and say, okay, what are the kinds of problems that are showing up here? A lot of systems in, that rely on language models tend to do really poorly with negation which is one of these things that's very important to the meaning, but tends to be a short word or a subword, um, and so it is easy to miss. So you can imagine, you know, speech recognition or machine translation. If you missed one word out of twenty, it matters a lot what that word is, right? If you if you replace a with the, in many cases, that's not going to cause a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. But if you just skipped a not somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, So, you know, all of this is basically about looking at what it is we're trying to build, what it is we're testing on, how it fits into the motivating use cases, um, and then what works and what doesn't. And for what doesn't work, what are the implications? Like what happens in the real world if that failure happens? And also what are the, what are the likely causes? So what is, Mm. what is tripping this up? Um, And so all of that is, is what we would like to see instead of the leaderboardism, which is everyone just trying to climb to the top of the pile on the benchmark, which doesn't feel like it's really, I mean, people talking about the speed of progress in AI love to talk about how quickly that those leaderboard changes and how how quickly the, the state of the art soda gets higher and higher on these various benchmarks. And I always think, yeah, but so like, what does that actually mean in terms of 
understanding the world better from a scientific point of view or you know building technology that works better not just in the average case but also in the worst case and so yeah it's interesting you know I, I, well i had a couple a couple things came up for me reading reading that paper i mean i think i when i started my career i think i it was just sort of on the tail end of acl papers where they would just it seemed like they would just cherry pick some examples you know, where it worked and where it didn't. And it just seemed like ridiculous. Like I remember they had early benchmarks and people would have like lower accuracy than just sort of guessing the most common case or something, which, Mm -hmm. you know, you could argue that's better and people did, but that just seemed, seemed a little ridiculous to me. And Mm -hmm. I I kept thinking, I remember there's the anecdote from your class about, I think it was Noam Chomsky, like saying that, oh, kids, you know, moms don't teach kids language, but they just actually, they do. And, and, um, and it's just like, no one, no one bothered to check, you know, so it's kind of maddening. And I, I yeah. think I appreciated benchmarks from that, but then your recommendations are like, not only reasonable, I think in companies, a lot of it is like, is like standard best practice. Like, I don't think you would just, you know, release uh, like a new model without, you know, kind of trying it and getting a flavor for like where, where it works and where it doesn't, you know, you wouldn't just be like, oh, we, you know, we took 10% of the data, held it out, <laughs> yeah. ship it, you know, but it does seem like, it does seem like that's actually one case where you see it more in, in companies than in sort of academic literature, probably because it's just easier to look at one number and be like, hey, we, we mm-hmm. beat it, but clearly that's, um that's flawed. So anyway, I, th- I thought that was a great, a great paper with really good suggestions that I, I think everyone should, <laughs> should definitely follow. <laughs> But uh, I mean, I guess I, I also want to make sure we got to the last paper that we talked about, which is cool because I just want to make sure people know what is what is the bender rule and uh, why is it important? So the, the bender rule or the hashtag bender rule. Um, yeah, and also is it hashtag bender rule? I was, I, it seems like. Yeah, I, well, I don't, it's both. So, say what it is first and then I have yeah. some questions about best um, practice. Yeah, so, so, so it is itself a best practice, which says that uh, you should always state the name of the language you're working on even if it's just English. And this came about, this is, a, this is a soapbox that I've been carrying around and periodically climbing up on um, since about 2009, um, where I saw a lot of that sort of pre-neural statistical NLP work saying, basically, look ma, no linguistics, and, and claiming that systems were language independent because there was no linguistic knowledge hard-coded. And these supposedly language independent systems were mostly tested on English. Right. Um, and you also see a lot of work where people will publish, you know, a paper on machine reading or a paper on sentiment analysis. And in fact, no, it's a paper on machine reading of English and sentiment mm. analysis on English text. And flip side is if someone's working on Cherokee or Thai or Chinese or Italian, then that work gets, it's harder to get it accepted to the research conferences because it is deemed language specific where work on English is somehow general. And that's, that's a big problem for the science, it's a big problem for getting to technology that actually works across languages. Um, and so I've been sort of going around pestering people to actually test cross-linguistically and to name the language they're working on. And in um, 2019, like three or four people, and this is, this is in that piece on the, um, on the gradient, I had their names listed, came sort of referred to this um, practice as the vendor rule. So I didn't name it, but once it was named, I, I ran with it. And Part of it is it's kind of a face threatening question to ask, right? If someone's written something about, you know, machine reading and I walk up and I say, well, what language, right? It's a stupid question to ask because it's obviously English. So it's face threatening to me. Um, mm-hmm. And it's also a little bit rude to them, right? To, to ask this question that says you should have said. And so I don't mind people blaming that on me. So like, so the part of the reason I ran with the, the hashtag is if someone wants to go ask this question and they feel like it's sort of a silly question to ask, they can, they can pin it on me and I'm happy to lend, lend my name to that. <laughs> I see. <So. laughs> nice. <laughs> and I, I guess this is a hard question, but I just, it's, you know, this is what it comes, comes to mind for me. It's mm-hmm. like, wow, you know, English is so specific and probably has all, all these kind of idiosyncrasies, syncrasies. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you, like, how do you think NLP might be different if it started in like Thai or Cherokee or something, or English just happened to, I mean, English yeah. must be unusual in all these ways. Right. Like, like, are there characteristics of English that are are unusual and the world could have gone a different way? Yeah, absolutely. So, and actually in that paper, I I list out a bunch of them. So one thing is English is a spoken language, not a signed language. So if we had, if we had started NLP with American sign language or another sign language, it would have been very different, I think. Right. Um, Clearly. Yeah. 
Um, so, you know, that's, that's, that's one big choice point. Another thing is that English has a very well-established and standardized writing system. And many of the world's languages don't have a writing system at all. And many of them that do don't have the degree of standardization that English does. Also, many languages will have um, a lot more code switching going on, on average, than English does. Um, although Sorry, English what is... Often- what is- what is code switching? Yeah. So code switching is when you um, use multiple languages in the same conversation, sometimes even in the same sentence. And that happens a lot in communities where there's a lot of bilingualism um, or multilingualism. So if you know, if you and I, well, you know, you also speak Nihongo, right? Mm-hmm. You said so. Um, yep. You know, uh, when you studied kanji, you know, what was your favorite way to benkyo them? Mm. I am not a fluent code switcher. So that was really awkward and stupid sounding, <laughs> but, but to, to illustrate the point, right? <laughs> I remember actually when, um, yeah, I, I know, and I, I've experienced that yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so certainly English is involved in a lot of code switching, but there's also lots and lots of monolingual English data. And when you go into, um, you know, social media data for Indian languages, for example, enormous amounts of it are, are code switched with English. And mm. so there's a whole range of, of interesting technical challenges that come up there. We, you know, live in a world where the first digital setups were sort of accommodated lower ASCII, the most conveniently English Mm -hmm. all fits in lower ASCII, right? Mm -hmm. English has relatively fixed word order. We have um, a relatively low, relatively simple morphology. So Mm -hmm. any given word that shows up is only gonna show up in a few different forms. Compare that to Turkish where you can get like, I think millions of inflected forms, the same root. And so that that changes the way you handle um, data sparsity and what data sparsity looks like. So yeah, you know, English, our, our orthography is a mess, right? <laughs> so, you know, the, someone was just asking on Twitter, how come we do grapheme to phoneme prediction, but not phoneme to graphing prediction? So grapheme to phoneme is given a letter, what's the likely sound? And mm-hmm. that's an important component of text-to-speech systems when you mm-hmm. hit an out of vocabulary word. Mm-hmm. Phoneme to grapheme would be given a sound, what's the likely letter? And that's not a typical task. And I wonder to what extent that's true because of English's opaque and chaotic writing system. Where right, given sounds, a sound, sounds like an impossible task. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if you were to look at, you know, so Japanese setting aside the kanji, if you're just trying to transcribe Japanese in kana, that's way more straightforward. Um, Spanish also has a very transparent and consistent um, grapheme to phoneme mapping in both directions. So, you know, down to things like that, but the, the properties of a writing system for English. Um, English likes to use white space between words and sentence final punctuation, right? These are, these are things that we sort of just take as given, that it's easy to tokenize into sentences and words that just aren't going to be true in other languages. Um, so I don't know. I couldn't tell you what NLP would look like. I can just sort of tell you sort of where the, the points of divergence might be. No, those are fun. Those are, yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, I, I don't know. I, 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 those differences are, are so... So interesting. <laughs> well, you, you voluntarily took a linguistics class, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> well, I think it's like, I mean, I just feel like linguistics is so cool. I mean, if, as an outsider, just because you, if you don't know it, then it's really eye-opening to just to, um, you know, because you swim in it mm-hmm. to sort of see, oh, there's all these patterns that I never would have noticed. And I feel like especially, well, I don't know, like phonetics is like probably the most like deep where you're just like, oh my God, those two sounds are different. Like I, I would not have, I would just never, never have noticed that. If, if, but then it's so clear to, it's so easy to do the thought experiment and realize you're wrong. That yeah. It's just, I don't know, I, I love that stuff. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's funny. I mean, it's, it, I remember, um, I don't know. I feel like most of my early work was in, you know, parsing Japanese in different ways. And so I do remember, mm-hmm. um, I do remember, well, I don't know, I, I guess it didn't seem like that was a like impediment to, to publishing, but it, it was surprising that there was so little work on it for how necessary of a task, like, you know, it, it, yeah. it would be to, to deal with it. And then, and then in my first job, it was mostly processing Japanese language stuff. And there's, it was, it was striking how little research there was to find on the topic. Mm-hmm. Like, I felt like there was just sort of more institutional knowledge inside of companies than, um, yeah. than literature yeah. on it. So. Because what happened in the research community is, well, that kind of parsing problem is solved, right? Because people had made a certain progress on it for English and right. that was mistaken as the problem in general being solved. So what's new here? Well, this is for Japanese. That's new. This hasn't been done, but it's actually hard to get people to see that. And so my 
my goal with you know, what got called the bender rule is to say, okay, let's keep English in its place and say, you know, when I've done this for English, I need to say that it's for English to hold room for the other work on other languages, which is also really important and, and novel and valuable. And we'll see, it's, um, you know, if we periodically go through different folks in the field, go through and count how many papers in an ACL conference actually work on different languages um, and actually say what language they work on. And it's not changing as fast as I'd like, but there's some really good developments. So the um, Universal Dependencies Project has produced tree banks for many, many languages, and that has spurred a whole bunch of a very cross linguistic work, which is exciting. And what do you think about, I mean, it, I mean, some of the most like evocative work feels like, you know, like building language models across like all the languages or like translation models that can kind of use pairs of languages in interesting ways where you have more data to help with ones with less data. I guess, do you, mm -hmm. do you think that's like a fruitful direction or does that, do you think that sort of like encodes our biases somehow in the, in the way it um, works? So, I mean, it's, it's certainly interesting. And to the extent that we're relying on these massive data hungry things where languages just don't have that much data, seeing what we can do based on, you know, transfer from the bigger languages is an interesting and valuable way to go. I think the interesting questions to ask would be, um, to what extent does this um, impose the conceptualization of the world encoded in English onto the results in these other languages? And, you know, what follows from that? Like, what, what are the risks and how does that compare to, well, but if we just do monolingual, we can only get this far. So we'll, we'll take those risks, we'll figure out how to mitigate them. That, that kind of work I think is important. And it's also really, really important to know that you are working with genuine data in the low resource languages. So there was this thing where it came out that I think it was Scots, the entire Scots Wikipedia was written by one person who doesn't speak Scots. Um, and Wikipedia is this really important data source in NLP. So any NLP system that claims we're doing something for Scots just isn't. And a fantastic model in that regard is this uh, research collective called Masakane, which is a continent spanning research um, initiative in Africa towards doing participatory research to create language resources for African languages. And they've done really interesting work on how to build up the community so that people can come contribute as, you know, as translators, not machine translation specialists, but people actually translating language. Um, and there's a, a really cool paper that came out in, I think, findings of EMNLP last year describing the Masaikane product, so project. So that kind of work of like, if you're gonna work with low resource languages, being sure to connect with the community who would be the people using the technology, then you could find out, you know, okay, well, what are the concerns? To what extent do you want to, you know, bring in what we can do from using the, the larger resource languages versus would you rather stay monolingual and see where we can go and, and, and you know, hear from the community and, and involve the community in the research. And I think Masakane is a, a great model of that. Cool. Well, that seems like a good place to end. We're way over time and okay. you've been really generous. So <laughs> thank you so much. But I, I, I yeah really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. I can, I can go on and on. So I appreciate the chance to do so. If you're enjoying these interviews and you want to learn more, please click on the link to the show notes in the description where you can find links to all the papers that are mentioned, supplemental material, and a transcription that we work really hard to produce. So check it out.